Hi, welcome to How to D&D. My name is Fred Wheeler and today I want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. And we're not necessarily talking about non-combat challenges or anything like that, although that would be fun and we might have a, a bit of a discussion about different ways of doing that. No, what we're actually going to do is we're going to do a Lost Mine of Fandalva Dungeon Master Guide. Big spoilers, if you're a player, don't be here because I will be showing you whole sections of the adventure. So don't hang around. Go watch a different video. You can come back later on and we'll have a discussion with you about something else. Now for those of you who are wondering how this is going to look, well, we're starting off with a map. I'm going to essentially be your dungeon master for today and we are going to go through each section bit by bit explaining what should be taking place and the sorts of options that players might have and how you can deal with those options if you need to. This isn't a actual running a combat or anything like that. This is just an overview of that whole process, okay? All right, so settle down, get comfortable, um, and let's have a, uh, have a look at what we've got to play with. Yes, I know what you're thinking. Holy Toledo. Yep, I managed to get it on my table. Took me a lot, but I did. Okay, all right, no more. Let us get on with this. So you have probably already introduced your players to a vast array of different things. At this point, you should have, if you've done your job properly, got them on the road. They've had their wagon ride. They've dealt with the uh, goblin um, ambush. And if they have been very lucky, they haven't fallen into a trap or a pit or something like that or set off a, uh, a snare of some kind. Uh, trying to find the, the hideout for the goblins. The trail is not that difficult to actually follow. So that shouldn't be an issue in your game whatsoever. And leading up to this location, um, we have our, our first scene. And you're going to read out the information on page 8. Now you can paraphrase it, you can read it out directly, that's totally up to you. And it's going to read something like this. Following the goblins trail, you come across a large cave and a hillside, five, mile, five miles from the scene of the ambush. A shallow stream flows out of the cave mouth, which is screened by a dense briar or thickets. A narrow dry path leads into a cave on the right hand side of the stream. Okay, at this point, your players may not be as close as I have placed the miniatures. So don't worry about that sort of thing. Get them to decide what they're going to do. Are they going to be sneaky and sneak up to that location? They don't know the goblins are in the thicket. Okay, even though I've put them out on the map, they don't know that they're behind that thicket. And those goblins aren't necessarily making enough noise for them to know they are there. So getting them to make some pe um, perception checks would be good, but they have to get close enough to be able to do that, right? So that's a stealth check. Now, if it's just one individual, you get them to make one stealth check. Um, if, you want the whole, if the whole group wants to move up together, then it's going to be a group check. And as long as they are success, half of them have to be successful. So that means you get them to roll a 20-sided dice each, okay? And add that to their, um, their stealth modifier. And if half the group are successful, what they're trying to do is they're, they're trying to get greater than, to be successful, they need to be greater than the passive perception of the goblins. Now the goblins don't have a particularly high um, um, perception, um, passive perception, so it shouldn't be that difficult, even if they are wearing heavy armour and they've got disadvantage on the stealth check. So that's your first step, deciding how they're going to approach. If they decide to be stealthy, then there's, got, there's a chance they can surprise the goblins and the briars. If they're not stealthy, the goblins will know. There's no requirement to make a check of any kind whatsoever. They will know because they're just making way too much noise. Okay, when they get close enough, if they haven't alerted the goblins, they can start making a perception check when they get close to the briars or the thickets. This is when you can start using your passive perception from a character, or you can get them to do an active roll of 20-sided dice roll and add that to their, uh, their perception modifier, okay? Either way is fine. Once we start dealing with how do you deal with the first encounter, the cave mouth, there's a couple of ways they can deal with this. They can sneak, sneak up and ambush those characters, so that means they could sneak up and attack them, 
Or if you've got somebody who can see them and has access to something like sleep, the spell sleep, well, guess what? Sleep is a very effective spell, even at low level. There's no saving throw. There's no attack roll. You can just do it. And that will put down two goblins pretty easily. That would be a good way of doing it. They can't. They don't have to kill the goblins. They can just knock them out if they drop them to zero hit points, if they're using a close quarter weapon, and then just tie them up. Um, they may be able to uh, negotiate and bribe them. There's lots of different options. They do not need to necessarily kill them. Sneaking past the goblins is going to be difficult. And the reason being is this little gap here. This still allows them uh, a view of the cave entrance. So they can't sneak past them successfully because they don't have cover right along here. There's cover here, but there's no cover just here. Okay? So that's the thing, the first thing to deal with. Okay. All right. So once they deal with their goblins, and we'll just take the goblins out of the picture for now because they're probably either tied up or dead at this present time. And they're moving up to the uh, front of the cave. Now, the order, marching order is important, so make sure you talk with your players about who's in the front, who's in the back, that sort of thing. That will be important. They can, if they decide to, send up just one individual or multiple individuals. That's fine too. We're going to get to what is essentially... Now, this was area two. This is area one. Okay. And I didn't read out the description of Area 2, but it, it's essentially there's goblin stashed um, um, hidden there, and you just read out that section. The box text is there. I won't go into it, okay? Let's skip that. All right, our next location is number 3, which is the kennels, which is over here, okay, where the, where the wolves are. There's three wolves, three doggies, three wolves, but only two are currently visible to the player's characters. One of them is behind the rock, which is why when you look at the entry, it's going to be a bit confusing. It's the easiest way to, to put it together. Um, there, there are some errors in the Lost Mon of Fandelva, but if you, unless you've got a really early printing, which you probably don't, it's not going to be an issue, right? Okay, Oop. so what, I don't know what I did just there, but I'm just going to check because I get the distinct feeling you wouldn't believe the nonsense that I had to go to to make this all work, and I feel like I might have just kicked the camera. Did I kick the camera? Yeah, I might have kicked the camera just a just a tiny, tiny little bit. Okay, all right. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, I haven't made too much of a mess. We'll just, just shuffle things around a little bit and uh, adjust it. There we go. There we go. Ah, uh, almost thought I took the whole thing down. <laughs> okay, so um, leading up to area three. So just as they're moving in now, for those, there's no light source in the caves. So that means it's all dark. If they've got dark vision, they can see in the dark. But if they make a perception check, they have disadvantage. If you use a, a passive perception check, you apply minus five to their passive perception, which means their, pe and their perception checks in the dark are going to be basically not as good as they could be. All right? What I will say is that if they have a light source, they will give themselves away almost immediately to goblins who have dark vision. Uh, that's just the nature of using a light source. But they will be able to see, and they won't need to worry quite so much about having disadvantage, depending on the range of the light source. I would not get too tied up in um, the range of light sources, because if you're starting out, the last thing you want to try and do is count squares and figure out if they're in bright light, dim light, or in darkness. Okay? All right, so the kennels. Just inside the cave mouth, a few uneven stone steps leads up to a small dark chamber on the east side on the east side of the passage. The cave narrows to a steep fissure at the far end and is filled with the stench of animals. Savage snarls and the sounds of rattling chains greet your ears. When two wolves are chained up just inside the opening, each wolf's chains lead to an iron rod driven into the base of the stalagmite. Okay, first off, it describes two, but we have three. As I said, one is behind the stones. What are some options for the player's characters? Well, one, you could say maybe there's enough um, space to allow them to sneak past, but we're dealing with a creature that has um, 
the ability to use scent and they'll be able to smell them um, and wolves are pretty good at that sort of thing so throwing them some rations and getting them distracted that way so they can move on uh, I would certainly allow a player who is capable of using animal handling maybe proficient and maybe a bit of a background or a spell um, animal friendship you know things like those can be really useful in this situation they do not have to kill the wolves they could just leave them alone that's perfectly fine distracting them with food casting a spell using animal handling but if they're going to use animal handling make sure they're doing something else with it whether it's up using food or they've got some sort of prop or whatever to stop them from winding up winding up being wolf food okay all right so this is the first location now if they decide to take out the wolves or try to befriend them in some way then they have access to the back door the back door is over here this is basically a, a chute or uh, an access route that they have to climb up which is not a very um, I wouldn't say it's a particularly difficult climb but that will get them access to Clark the main bugbear the leader of this location okay so we're gonna say at this point wolves should be dealt with at this present time what I will say is entering just here if you have a look at the line of sight and the range there is a goblin over here on the on the bridge and as soon as they get to about here this is where the the dams can be released that goblin can whip on off and go and tell his mates that are over here and they can release the first dam this will wind up resulting in them being washed down uh, the stream but you know you may not do that straight away you might find that they move into this location first the goblin goes and tells the other goblin they make arrangements and these wolves are either um, destroyed um, or befriended or a spell cast on them and now the players have the opportunity to go and explore or decide to go up the chute they don't have to do this it's it's optional and it's not necessarily going to be the best option simply because that fissure there okay requires a an athletics check to get up there successfully not only that if they get at the top they can only really get one up there at a time so that means that one of them is going to have to deal with Clark very very shortly okay that's 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 a fact is Clark there's a wolf up there in this location so Clark is the bugbear wolf two goblins and they're on their own until the rest of the party shows up so um, and falling off that uh, it's not a huge check it's a DC 10 so it shouldn't be difficult for them to do but they could all right so that's the first location now we get to here and whoever steps out first is probably going to be the first one who starts moving up here is going to get washed out now will they see the goblin at the end well the goblin doesn't necessarily have to be standing right on that bridge that goblin can be standing um, on this to the side looking down through this cave area okay so you can place them on the bridge or you can place them close to the bridge that's fine too okay now the washout the flooding of the cave whoever decides to step out first and start walking up that location how does that get worked out well as it happens you'll find that there are instructions now whereabouts is that I believe that should be in section 5 or 4 and we were talking about uh, okay here we go so we're moving into section 4 or towards section 4 um, it says the main passage from the cave mouth climbs steeply upward and the stream plunging and splashing down at west down the west side in the shadows a side passage leads west across the other side of the stream so this is this location here the climb is not very difficult stealth checks would be a smart idea so that they don't wind up getting into too much trouble and I found that most groups will do that and be reasonably successful um, in terms of uh, taking the route up this way um, up underneath the bridge that's not a smart move because that goblin's gonna spot them 
And even if they do see the goblin, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get a chance to actually um, shoot the goblin and take him out. Now, there's a lot of noise taking place in this location. Okay, so one of, there's a waterfall. Now, waterfall is located way over here. And that means that whatever takes place in any particular part of the um, caves won't be trans. You know, the sound won't travel to there. Be so, in other words, you don't have to worry about the whole cave falling on the uh, the player's characters once they engage in a single combat. The sound will will not echo. It's been drowned out by that that waterfall. Um, okay. So um, now light sources. Now we talked about the the bridge. In the shadows of the ceiling to the north, you can just make out in the, in, da, in the dim shape of a rickety bridge of wood rope crossing over the passage ahead of you. Another passage intersects with this one 50 feet above the floor. So this is what they're talking about, this location here. They don't have to go up there though. I think actually the smart move is to go this way and then come back round. And I know that there's an incomplete section here in the map, but bear with me, I'm doing the best I can. Okay, uh, now where is it? Um, yeah, here we go, flood. The flood section's on page 10, and it says in big exclamation marks, flood. You need to make a dexterity check, and um, you need to also uh, exceed the passive perception of, where is it, the goblin. That's right. So you're making a dexterity check, and you'll, you, in terms of stealth, sneaking, sneaking up past that location, you can sneak up on the goblin, um, it's darkness, and so the, the goblin still suffers the same sorts of penalties as a, a player character. That's disadvantage on passive, passive perception, so that's a minus five. And if you make a check and don't use a passive check, and you make a, a dice roll instead, then you're applying disadvantage. So you roll two dice, okay? So this applies to not just the players, it also applies to goblins. And uh, yes, you can make your way through that section there. Um, if they get hit by the water, which it's entirely possible, um, it's a DC 10 dexterity saving throw, and you could wind up taking two six-sided dice worth of bludgeoning damage. So that's just two six-sided dice. That's quite a lot for a level one character, though, and be knocked prone. And you'll also probably get sort of pushed part way out of the, uh, the location. Okay, the overhang is area five, which is there's this one goblin that we talked about over here. So the, the, the stream passage continues up beyond another set of uneven steps ahead. Bending eastward as it goes, a waterfall sounds out from a larger cavern somewhere ahead of you. This is that waterfall I was talking about. A rickety bridge spans the passage, connecting two tunnels that are 20 feet above the stream. So that's how high the bridge is. So there's no sort of climbing up or jumping up to grab hold of the bridge if you want to. Wouldn't be a smart idea. It's not a very strong bridge as it is. That's that one goblin. This goblin's job here is not to fight or shoot at the uh, player's characters. This goblin here is supposed to go run this way. Tell everybody else. They go tell Clark. They release the um, dams. And this one can just sit here and wait and peek around the corner taking shots at the player's characters if they put themselves into position. You would not really position yourself over there. They, you, you could decide as the dungeon master, I'm going to have this goblin be a runner. He's gone and informed these goblins, and then he will run and tell the other goblins in this location, in area six. You certainly could do that if you really wanted to, but you don't have to do that. Okay, right, so those are your come, a couple of your options. All right, so that's area five. We've talked about the bridge. Um, we're dealing with, we've dealt with the flood. Um, and next, I believe, we're dealing with, oh, now was it the flood? The flood's actually one six-sided dice of bludgeoning. Rubbling. Ah, uh, yes, that's the rubble. Never mind. Sorry, I got a little bit confused. Okay, so area six. We're over here now. Let's deal with this location. This is area six. This is a bit more complicated because we've got a, um, uh, a prisoner. That's Sildar Hallwinter. He's been held prisoner. Uh, this large cave is divided in half by a 10-foot high encampment. A steep natural staircase leads from the lower portion of the um, upper ledge. The air is hazy with the smoke from a cooking fire and the pungent smell of poorly cured hides and unwashed goblins. 
Sounds delicious. Okay, so you've got six, got six goblins in this location. Same thing applies. They've got a bit of a light source going on here because there is light, the, the cooking. So um, the penalties on dark vision um, will only apply uh, once it sort of extends beyond the range of the firelight, which is quite a long way. I think it's like it's between 20 and 30 feet, I believe. But as I, as I said, I wouldn't worry about that sort of thing too much. Um, Sildar Hallwinter, this is Salt Sildar Hallwinter, this is um, Yimmick, the, uh, the main boss or goblin um, chief uh, for this location. And these goblins are going to do the rest of the job. So what do we do with this location? How do we deal with this location here? Well, the great thing about this location is, one, you can sneak up on the, these goblins. You do not need to um, destroy them or kill them if you don't want to. You can negotiate. The leader will negotiate. You can't be trusted. Yimmick is not not somebody to be trusted. They might might say, yes, we'll, we'll give up Sildar Hallwinter, um, and Yimmick will might uh, request that you go and destroy or take out their leader, uh, Clark, the bugbear. Not a very good choice, but you could do that if you really wanted to. Um, sneaking up on this location shouldn't be too difficult. The problem is, even if you do get surprise, Yimmick is in a good position to, to kill Sildar. Sildar has one hit point, wouldn't be very hard, for, uh, for that to take place. So you have to be very, very quick if you're going to do that. Make it quite clear to them too, the situation, if they do try to um, rush the goblins. You can role play. Now I've done videos on role playing just about all of the uh, characters in this adventure. You can role play Yimmick to your heart's content. Okay, by all means, he won't necessarily engage in a fight. If the players start it, they're going to finish it. So when you get to about here, so we'll move everybody over and we'll put the rogue up here and there we go. Okay, so we're moving into this location, next location. How do we deal with this? You can use spells. I would say if you have a, a player who has access to um, spells like sleep, sleep is a really good spell because even with so many goblins, you're going to put down close to one third to a half of the goblins are going to just go down because they have so few hit points and there's no saving throw, there's no attack roll, you just roll your five eight-sided dice and that's it. And then whatever you get allows you to put down that many points worth of uh, creatures in the, the area that you cast it. So a really good spell. Uh, Yimmick is second in command, so he doesn't really want to be second in, in command, he wants to actually be first in command. This is probably... I would say the second hardest fight in this location if they do engage in a battle rather than the, the first the first hardest battle. Uh, the, the worst one will be with the bugbear. By all means, that, that'll be the hardest one that they have to face. Okay. All right. So Sildar Hallwinter has a whole lot of information that he can pass on to the player's characters. I've done a video on Sildar Hallwinter, so I'm not going to talk about that any more than I have now. Just go and check out that video. There's heaps of information on that. Goes into a lot of depth on how to role play um, Sildar Hallwinter as well. Okay, and there's lots of information on page 11 for doing that, or using him, him as an NPC in the party for now. Okay, so we're moving on to section seven. So I'm going to just put this down. They don't have to save. Um, or kill the goblins. They don't have to save Sildar Hallwinter. Sildar Hallwinter might die. It's entirely possible. He might perish with everybody else, or they might have him in tow. Now, at this point, they can make, make their way up back along the stream location if they want, or they can come round this way and use the bridge. Now, the bridge is probably a better option compared to other, some of the other options available. One, because they can see all the way down here what's going on and a goblin here would would be noticed more than likely and this goblin would actually not be um, picked up if it was sort of hiding behind a uh, a rock outcrop so like around a corner or something and then you can set up an ambush if you want to and they should be this goblin should be ta taking um, note of who what's going on down here and what's going on down here and you can ready an action to fire an arrow or something like that if you really want to but remember it's darkness, okay, they still have disadvantage on their passive perception or their active uh, perception checks. Okay, all right, so section seven, which is where we get to the pulls. 
once they get past everything else. What do we do there? Well, look at your section, read it out to them once they get into that location. So we'll, we'll move them down a little bit. We'll move them to about here. And there. That'll do. I'm only using four characters because it's just less for me to move around. This cavern is half filled with two large pools of water. A narrow waterfall high in the east wall feeds the pool, which drains out the west end of the chamber to form a, the stream that flows out of the, uh, the cave mouth below. Low field stone walls serve as dams. Now, this section here, to hold the water back, you might have actually used the flood twice. You can do it twice. It's not just one application. If they come up this way, you can flood this location more than once. You do it twice. So you might not be reading out about there being any kind of wall sections. These wall sections may in fact already be gone if they've, they've let the, um, the dam um, free. A wide east, um, a wide exit stands to the south, while two smaller passages lead west. The sound of the waterfall echoes through the cavern, making it difficult to hear. So this is the thing you need to remember. Sneaking up on um, anything in this location or hearing somebody is actually very difficult. So you really got to re rely on sight and you're dealing with darkness and dark, and dark vision so it's not necessarily going to be perfect. There are three goblins and although there are three goblins here you're probably going to wind up with four goblins in this location and if you're really really cruel and you've informed Clark, Clark can move his forces and he probably would to ambush and set up an ambush in this location and call this basically a, a kill field. He can pull all these goblins back and have them positioned over here waiting in this one room. So you could have the whole, all those forces just sitting there waiting. Which would be horrible for level 1 characters, I can tell you now, but certainly it's an option if you want to. Uh, now, how do you deal with 3 or 4 goblins? Sleep is a good option yet again you may not have access to it you might have already used it um, bribery is probably not going to be an option they're more afraid of Clark at this present they're way too close to Clark to really be negotiated with uh, tricking them still pretty difficult to do so you really sort of you're going to have to play this out the hard way unfortunately and although this looks like a really good sort of um, choke point the choke point doesn't really work if you don't have ranged attacks. The goblins are all going to have short bows, so they can pepper the uh, player's characters with um, arrows if they wanted to. All right, so um, I'm going to move on, and I'm, we're going to assume at this present time that they managed to take out these goblins. If all goes well, these goblins are down. And they are now in location 7, moving towards location 8, the last location for this, um, this, lo um, this area. For so sneaking up, by all means, get them to make stealth checks if they want to make stealth checks. If they don't make stealth checks, then they suffer. That's how it is. Um, now, Clark's cave, once they move into that location, I think you'll find by the time they get there that Clark knows that they're coming. So that means that goblins are going to be positioned in such a way is to be able to ambush and cause an awful lot of trouble for them. So you can position them behind rocks and so forth, um, set them up in such a way that they can sort of ambush the party who are coming in. Because they know they're coming. More than likely, the chances are Clark should always know that they're coming. Okay. Sacks and crates of looted provisions are piled up in the south end of this large cave. To the west... The floor slopes toward a narrow opening that descends into darkness. Okay, so what is that? We know what that is. This is the thing over here. Um, a larger opening leads north down a set of natural stone steps. This is where the, the players are likely to be coming. Coming up this way. Probably the best way to come. I, I've heard of people coming up the other way and it's worked out really well, but I feel like uh, the dungeon master was being very nice. The roar of the falling water echoes from beyond. In the middle of the cavern, the coals of a large fire are smouldering. And this is where Clark, the bugbear, the wolf ripper, and the two goblin um, uh, bodyguards are waiting. 
Okay, so how do I play this out and how do I deal with this? I'll tell you right now, bug bears are really bad if they get surprised on the player's characters. It'll probably result in the player's characters getting absolutely destroyed. Uh, particularly if the bugbear hits. If the bugbear misses, not so bad. Now remember, I know a lot of people get confused with this. Just because you have surprise does not mean you have advantage on your attacks, on your first attack. Surprise just means you get to act in the first round. And if you are surprised, then you don't get to act in the first round. But if you... If you are dealing with something where you can't see the attack, so often that means melee attacks don't work, then what's really going to happen is you're going to get advantage. It's unseen attackers that get advantage, not having surprise. Okay, So don't get confused with that. Don't apply um, advantage unless the attacks are unseen. And usually that doesn't work unless you are using cover. Uh, which you would be able to hide behind and you're firing with a ranged weapon. Okay, so our player's characters will move into this location and oh, here we go. There's our goblins and our player characters are coming in. And this is where you spring your trap. Okay. The space allows for essentially between one and two player characters or creatures to get through. Um, they may need to squeeze to get through there. It looks like it's just one, but actually when you look at it, I'll just move it out of the way. See, it's more like one and a half squares. So that means that a player character or a, a creature could squeeze into that space or use that space there. Okay? So that's certainly an option for you if you wanted to. How do you deal with Clark? Clark is just there to destroy things. I've done a video on how to deal with Clark, how to role play him, what he's most likely to do in combat, uh, and that covers most of that sort of stuff. Um, I'll say right now that the goblins will stay in the fight as long as Clark is fighting. If Clark goes down, then they will probably surrender unless they have the, the upper hand. Uh, Clark is not going to be happy if Ripper gets um, taken out, so um, by all means, uh, you can change your tactics if the wolf gets destroyed or um, knocked out or killed or subdued in some way. Okay? All right, so that is the basic gist. I don't want to do anything more. Um, again, if you have access to things like sleep, then sleeping the, um, the you know, player's characters sleeping the goblins is a smart move. That doesn't mean that um, they can't be woken up. It's just another thing to remember. Um, if you found this useful or helpful, then please make sure to subscribe, like, and share the video. I have many videos on this particular topic, and you're welcome to go and check them out. Yes, there will be more videos of this um, type in the future, so you're welcome to keep coming back. I have an, uh, a Patreon page where you can support the channel, so I keep doing more content like this. Um, they get exclusive content, and they also get priority on videos that I make. I have a affiliate links down in the description to the book depository and Amazon, where you can buy stuff online, and I get a small commission, which is very helpful for making sure that the channel just keeps doing what it's doing. And um, if you have any questions, start putting those questions into your chat right now. And if you have any feedback and things you want to add, then by all means, put that in. Um, and hey, till next time, Keep rolling those 20s.